creatures which are neither apes nor humans, but something in between. Creatures with names like Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus robustus. Professor Francis Thackeray is an expert on South Africa's hominin fossils. The very first fossil of Australopithecus africanus from Africa was this one. This is a replica of the famous Tawung child. Tawung is situated near Kimberley in the interior of South Africa. It was discovered in 1924. Even though it's a child, it can be recognized as a hominid. There is the brain case. Here is the front of the face and the lower jaw. We believe it to be two and a half million years old. There is evidence that this was a biped, a creature that walked on two legs and it had a small brain. It confirmed in 1925 what Charles Darwin had said about Africa being the continent on which human ancestors evolved. The most precious fossils are kept in a vault in Witwatersrand University in Johannesburg, including the skull of Taung Child. Well, these are among the most valuable fossils as part of Africa's paleontological heritage. It was probably killed by an eagle that took it up to a cave. How do you know that? We know that because of damage to the part of the skull. There are little holes there in the eye sockets, which would have been made by the talons of an eagle that carried the Taung child to a nest. Poor thing. Life for our early ancestors was perilous. Staying up in the trees afforded them some protection from predators. But at some stage, hominins began to walk on two legs. One theory holds that as the climate changed, there was less woodland and more grassland, so there was a greater abundance of food on the ground. The realization that these creatures walked habitually on two legs is important because that became a key characteristic of humans, which distinguishes us from apes. It meant that we could have our hands free and use our intelligence to get up to all sorts of things like making tools and hunting with weapons. If you're a large ape and you're walking along on four legs, um, although you can stand up periodically, your hands cannot carry things any distance. Your hands are not structured to handle things with precision. Once you become upright habitually, and your hands are free. All sorts of anatomical changes take place in terms of how you use your hands, how you use your shoulder, how you use your elbow. There's no question that chimps are intelligent. There's no question that porpoises are intelligent. But without free hands, they can't do much about their intelligence. Scientists believe they can date the point at which our line diverged from other primates like gorillas and chimpanzees at about seven million years ago. This started the process which led to us becoming fully upright or bipedal. I think a date of around seven million years is where to look for our ancestors. It does seem that the molecular evidence suggests a split from the chimps somewhere around seven. It's not a precise figure, it could be eight, it, million. it could be nine million, but I think at this stage we can say that full bipedalism, which I, for me is part of the fundamental definition of being human or prehuman, doesn't come in until between four and a half and five from what we have seen so far. As the archaeologists and paleontologists continue their work, more and more discoveries are made which help us fit a small part of the jigsaw puzzle that makes up the evolution of humankind. More accurate methods of dating fossils have been developed that help us to do this. Hominins have been found in other parts of the world, but none is as old as those in Africa. One important and famous discovery was the skeleton of Lucy in Ethiopia in 1974. What was remarkable about her was that archaeologists discovered quite a lot of her skeleton, enough to get a good sense of what she looked like. 
Lucy, as she's known to the world, lived about 3.2 million years ago. I've come to the National Museum of Ethiopia in the capital Addis Ababa, where her remains are kept. Hello, hello, Hi. Professor. Hi. How are you? Nice, nice to, to see you. you. Hello, thank you. Yeah. Hello, Yari. Ethiopians call her Dinkanesh, and her actual bones are under lock and key in a special room where the temperature is controlled. I'm privileged to be allowed to see the real Dinkanesh, or Lucy, with one of Ethiopia's leading paleoanthropologists, Johannes Haile Selassie. Now, she was a hominid, which means she was sort of part ape, part human-like? She had some ape-like features. Uh, for example, we, when we look at the reconstruction of her head, uh, we see that her face uh, points a little bit forward, like unlike modern humans, where we have very flat face. And that's a very primitive trait that she has acquired from an ape-like ancestor. So and she was erect. She walked she on was two erect. legs. She was walking on two legs. She was a very tiny woman, about three feet tall, uh, about a meter. About a meter. About yeah, but she was fully adult. Her brain size was not larger than an ape's. Uh, we were talking about 300, 400 cc of brain capacity, which is within the range of chimpanzees that you see today. So when did brain size get bigger? We have some evidence in terms of when did we start enlarging our brain size. And it, it, look, it appears that it started growing, not as much as what we see in modern humans today, but compared to Lucy's species or whoever descended directly from her, there is a good correlation between the use of stone tools and the incorporation of meat as a major part of their diet. So I know that some of the oldest stone tools in the world have been found in Ethiopia dating about two and a half million years yes. ago. Would Lucy have used stone tools? All these early human ancestors could have used tools in some way because chimpanzees use tools. They don't make tools, so some of them do. Like they make twigs, they sharpen them and use them to fish for like uh, termites. Uh, so these early human ancestors somehow must have used some kind of tool. Scientists are constantly trying to work out how the various types of hominin are related, in which part of Africa they originated, and how and when they migrated. What is clear is that other lines died out, and there was just one, the Homo genus, which led directly to us. Let's look at the line which led to us humans. The best evidence so far takes us back to the East African Rift Valley, where a number of hugely significant archaeological finds have been made. Here in the Old Divide Gorge in northern Tanzania, Conditions created by volcanic activity made the soil and rock here ideal for finding fossils and stone tools. The Leakey family spent many years working in the Old Divide Gorge, and it was where Richard Leakey's brother Jonathan discovered the first evidence in Africa of the species which was our direct ancestor. So, in 1961, my brother Jonathan discovered partial skull and a lower jaw that was clearly not Australopithecus or Paranthropus, but it was much more like what you would expect for an early us. It had a larger brain, it had a hand that was capable of much more manipulation of, of objects, and they call that handyman or homo habilis. So can you categorically say that homo habilis is the earliest fossil find of the line that gave rise to modern humans? I think if we're going to be accurate, I don't think one could say it is indisputable. The, the majority of, of um, scientists studying the origin story recognize Homo habilis at 1.8 million years as probably the best and earliest evidence of a group or a lineage or a line that ultimately leads to us. So this is when the evolutionary chain begins to look recognizably human. 
To put it at its simplest, Richard Leakey identifies these key species in the line that led to us. From the fossils which have been found, there's evidence from 2.1 million years ago of Homo habilis, the handyman so called for his ability to make tools. From around 1.8 million years ago, there was Homo erectus, who was more upright and developed more sophisticated tools. Modern Homo sapiens, meaning wise man, emerge about 200,000 years ago. Genetically modern humans, that is us, began to appear at around 100,000 years ago. So we've looked at the process of evolution, how we parted company from gorillas and chimpanzees and became modern Homo sapiens. But what about the why? Why is it that humankind evolved in Africa and not elsewhere in the world? Well, it's the climate of Africa thousands of years ago which gives us the answer to that key question. These giraffes are enjoying the lush vegetation of the wide open savanna here in the Serengeti in Tanzania. Giraffes are, of course, amongst the most distinctive and easily recognised members of the animal kingdom. And this kind of environment was and still is ideal for supporting animal life. It was this climate and landscape, like the open grassland in the Serengeti, which gave rise to the perfect conditions for the evolution of the great apes, gorillas, chimpanzees and the ape men who developed into humans. There was then, and still is now, plenty of game for carnivores to hunt. When you're here in the Serengeti, it's clear that the rules of engagement are eat or be eaten. Just about every animal is either on the lookout for something to eat or is watching fearfully to avoid being eaten itself. And early humans were part of that way of life. It was all about survival. And I think I'm going to get back into the car because I may be coming in between a lion and its dinner. While parts of Africa, like the Serengeti, are obviously lush and rich in wildlife, others are arid. But that doesn't mean they were always like that. Over the course of the millennia, the climate changes. For instance, the Sahara Desert dried out through time. Until about 10 to 12,000 years ago, it supported animal and plant life. One of the most striking demonstrations of this is to be found in the Sahara in the north of Sudan. It's hard to imagine that the Sahara Desert in northern Sudan wasn't always like this. I'm at the site of the petrified forest just outside the town of Al Kuru, where there's clear evidence that there was a lush tropical climate here. There were giant trees. You can see the fossilized tree trunks around me. There was water running through here, and at some stage many millions of years ago, these trees fell into the water. There was silica in the water, and this, combined with the high temperature, led to a chemical process whereby the tissues of the tree trunks were replaced by the silica, preserving them for posterity by fossilizing them. So where there is now desert, you have to imagine tall forests and grasslands with wild animals. The art of our ancestors also tells us a great deal about how the climate in some parts of Africa has changed. 
These paintings in North Africa in Algeria are in the middle of the Sahara Desert. There are thousands of them, like a rock art gallery. And what is so amazing is that outside the land is barren desert, but inside the caves we see a world teeming with animals just like those which populate the Serengeti today. Experts can't be sure when early humans started to acquire the imagination that led them to creating art. But cognitive complexity had reached the point where imagination was in place more than three million years ago. Though the art we see here probably dates back to around 10,000 BC. Algerian professor Sliman Hatchi is an archaeologist specializing in rock art. I meet him in Algiers. Why do you think that early humans in the Stone Age period would want to depict these images? Est-ce que cet art est un art documentaire? Est-ce que ils ont peint ou gravé pour nous dire voilà comment nous vivons, voilà ce que nous avons autour de nous? Certainement oui, mais certainement non aussi. Certainement oui, bien sûr, que cet art nous documente, nous permet de savoir avec quel type d'animaux ces populations-là vivaient. Mais ce n'est pas le but de cet art. Cet art est un art, est une écriture, est une écriture de mythes, de mythogrammes. Ce sont des mythogrammes qui nous sont transcrits par ces préhistoriques. Évidemment, ils décrivent des scènes de vie quotidienne, n'est-ce pas Mais il y a des images, il y a des représentations qu'on ne comprend pas à première vue, qu'on ne comprend pas à première vue et qui veulent dire quelque chose. The study of the origins of humankind leads us to the very important consideration of what it is to be human. To me, what makes us human is we have extraordinary dexterity in our hands. We can use our hands in association with our brain and our eyesight to do all sorts of things. We have complex cognition and, and complex brains. Uh, I think we have a cognition system that enables us to, to put ourselves in time, both previous and, and forward-looking. I think once you can plan something, because you can discuss tomorrow as well as experience from yesterday, I think you have a great advantage. Um, I think accessing rich diets was critical to becoming us. I think those are the issues that we're looking for, and one which at the moment seems to defy um, research of the kind we do is, is the origin of speech. And, and, and once you can convey complex messages as opposed to messages, you have an unfathomable advantage of everything else. The difference between us and the rest of the animal kingdom is that it is only humans who use words. We have the power of speech. The majority of experts in this field believe that it was Homo erectus who first used words, which means our earliest ancestors communicated through speech about one and a half million years ago. I, it, it's really fascinating. You know, the Hadzane speak a click language known as Hadzane. And um, it's believed by some experts that since it is similar to click languages spoken by the San people of southern Africa, that therefore there is a link between them and the Hadzabe and that they possibly share a common ancestor. It's, it's possible that uh, the early language may have been a, a click language. The Hadzabe and, and Kunsan of South Africa are believed to be indigenous uh, people, uh, particularly in the Africa south of the Sahara. People believe that this early language may have been a Greek language, like that of Hadza today, or, or even uh, the Kunsan of the Kalahari. The Hadzabe have taught us so much about how our early human ancestors survived, lived, how they ordered their societies and their beliefs. Before I take my leave of them, I end my visit on a very enjoyable note. They want to show me one of their special dances, which they perform before a hunt. Bye, 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 bye.
Learning about the process of evolution makes you really think about what it is to be human. Dancing, singing, talking, telling stories and jokes, creating art, making things with our hands, having some kind of belief system and spirituality. All these things are part of the makeup of humankind. And Africa is where it began. We all came out of Africa. The fact that humans around the world are part of the original African diaspora cannot now be argued. Scientifically, culturally it's still argued. The, I think the prejudice against Africa and, and, and all that's gone into their thinking about Africa probably will take longer to break down, but break it down we must. And we will only break it down not with fairy tales, but with facts. In the second program of Africa's history, I'll be looking at how humans became pastoralists and farmers living in settled communities, and at how the Iron Age transformed lives and paved the way for the development of the urban civilizations of Africa.